Just saying. <laughs> also just saying that the covenant after the flood was made not only with man, but with the animals, with all flesh, a phrase repeated several times to make sure we get it. You can't make a covenant with a lifeless object. God spoke directly to the animals, which means they have beings and souls in that story. And the passage usually interpreted, interpreted as dominionism, man rules and can do whatever he likes to animals, can also be read as a warning to the animals. Man's imagination is evil unto his youth, and he will behave that way and grab all you've got. So run away very fast. By recorded times, we already, no doubt as a continuation of unrecorded times, we have holy days and holy places, special foods, consecrated foods, daily foods, feast time foods, and forbidden foods. What you eat, how you worship, what kind of culture you live in, and what supplies it needs to sustain itself, all are linked. But all early religions acknowledged the bond between man and nature. They understood that what sustains us comes from the earth, all of it. Fast forward to medieval times where the cosmology was mirrored by the interior decoration of cathedrals. The heavens above with stars, God, and angels Creation at one end of the story, replete with garden beginnings and communication with animals as well as with God. Then the story unfolding around the walls with resurrection and revelation at the end. Pillars oddly like tree trunks holding it all up. On the stone and wooden and stained glass decorations, a veritable jungle of plants and fruit and flowers and birds and animals. Sometimes a green man, that mysterious figure speaking forth vegetation, who was probably a wood spirit or a plant spirit. All was included, the whole creation and all of history contained as if in a glass snow globe. Man and nature together under God, who was on the ceiling, <laughs> sometimes in a stained glass window at the top. But then the top blew off. The advent of the telescope revealed a universe much bigger than was supposed. The planets were not shining crystalline globes. They were um, kind of bumpy. Saturn had moons, the moon had mountains and valleys. The Earth went round the sun and was not at the center of the solar system, much less of the universe. Then Newtonian physics made the whole thing look like a mechanism, and the invention of clocks provided a metaphor for this new view. The universe as a vast clock set going by a master watchmaker who was now not overseeing everything and intervening with miracles, but strangely elsewhere. Nature too was a machine, and animals were machines who did not feel pain or have emotions. How strange that this was believed, but also how convenient. Man alone had a soul and or a mind, the famous ghost in the machine, the machine being another clock, his body. It is at this time that animals came to be thought of as dumb and stupid, without feeling, without language, mere machines who obeyed only their mechanical settings. Earlier societies would never have made this mistake. People who worked with animals did not make it. But it was a widely accepted so-called 
scientific credo. Blake um, rebelled against this view. He proposed nature as divine, and um, he wrote a well-known rebellion against Newton. The atoms of Democritus and Newton's particles of light are sands upon the Red Sea shore where Israel's tents do shine so bright. Other people might look at a tree and see a tree. Blake looked at a tree and saw a tree full of angels praising God. The other rebellion came from the Romantics who held, who held that nature is sentient, that is, it's conscious and um, does have emotions, is responsive. And uh, one of his lines is, it is my faith that every flower enjoys the air it breathes. And the scientists of that time dismissed these people as, um, I won't say raving loonies, uh, I will say <laughs> sissy poets. <laughs> <laughs> then along came another scientific discovery that again altered the worldview, and that was the discovery of electricity, which gave um, birth to another whole spate of metaphors. Uh, that's where we get our expression frayed nerves. People thought that you were, you were um, basically an electrical system, which in some ways is, is true, but they thought that your nerves were like electric wires and and when you were um, having a, an emotional crisis, it was because those electrical wires had got frayed, <laughs> just like real ones, and um, that you need to be rewired. <laughs> uh, but it also gave, gave rise to another possible world view, that we were in fact all connected through invisible electrical vibrations of some kind. The upsurge of spiritualism is connected with us, uh, and so was the invention of a, a whole bunch of electrical machines that you could um, rejuvenate yourself with in one way or another. You could, you could wear voltaic belts, for instance, uh, and you could buy machines that you could plug yourself into. I don't know who, how many people got electrocuted by doing this. <laughs> This was the belief that you could recharge yourself like a battery. Uh, do not try this at home. <laughs> then along came Darwin, who gave rise to another worldview. And um, you know about his famous uh, theory of evolution, but in it, man is akin to the animals, uh, a lot more closely akin than people found comfortable. Uh, strangely enough, Darwin himself proposed that animals have, have emotions, but the Darwinists who picked up from some of his theories ignored this, um, and especially the kinds of scientists who liked to do um, experiments on animals. They were still um, adhering to the animals don't really feel um, view of, of life because of, I think just because it was convenient. And social Darwinists like Hitler misappropriated Darwin to horrific effect. Um, you'll be happy to know, however, that, actually you'll be unhappy to know, <laughs> you'll be unhappy to know first that the people in the late 20th century who came back to studies of animals as having emotions and being responsive and having languages were at first dismissed by the orthodox scientific community as being, again, uh, soft romantics and raving loonies. But, but they're now uh, coming around to it, especially with the work of people like Franz de Waal. And his book is called The Age of Empathy. And it contradicts the previous orthodoxy, which held that we are all inherently selfish. Uh, and that we are all inherently aggressive. <coughs> and uh, the age of empathy is about studies that he has done with certain animals such as elephants and chimpanzees, which upholds what, what we would like to believe 
it upholds what we would like to believe that true altruism is possible that you you can in fact help people without having some selfish motive underneath it chimpanzees will do that elephants are very socially interactive and if you would like to read more about that the book is the age of empathy france de waal w a a l this is an encouraging counter thrust to the previous hardcore darwinist type of views so now even in religion we seem to be moving towards a more holistic view of the world a view in which man and nature are connected once more in the christian religion there are two views about this one is the stewardship model which i can see that you embrace which i'm happy to see that you embrace um, people should try to save the earth because it is a divine creation and not incidentally because if we don't the results will be horrific misery and ultimate extinction uh, not for nature but for us 